My name is Ed Zerker. I'm the city manager. It's good to be here with you. Uh, Councilman Castor is coming, but she said she wanted to get things going, so we didn't delay you any further. Uh, so we have some housekeeping and a video that we'll show you. So I'll start with that, uh, the housekeeping information. So welcome to our, this is actually budget area number 319. So you guys are right at the beginning on our 2019-2020 city uh, budget. What we have is a uh, process where the city manager puts out some ideas to get re reaction and feedback from the community about how to deal with our budget, primarily our general fund budget that funds police and fire, parks and libraries. So thank you for being here with us. We do have a Spanish language interpreter, to Gloria. Will you introduce yourself? Thank you. I want to uh, thank our city staff who are here uh, after work hours, but this is this is work as well. So thank you to our city staff. They're here to, for two reasons. One is that it's good for us to listen and hear what people have on their minds, the city staff. But also if there are specific issues. We have people who can be here to address those directly with you if there's something really specific. So I want to uh, thank our city staff for being here. Um, I ask you uh, to pick up a budget tab, we call these budget tab tabloids, that has some detailed information in it. There's more detail here than will be in the video. There's even more video, uh, detail for you if you're interested at phoenix.gov slash budget. You can get into a whole lot of detail there. Uh, if you want to read more, learn more, dig in, go to our website. Also, if you'd like to speak tonight, we're going to ask you to come up here and speak from the microphone. That's so everyone can hear, but also so that our Phoenix TV crew can see you. This is being taped and when we put on the city's YouTube channel, uh, Phoenix TV, and that way other people who aren't here can see it. Primarily council members. We have another budget hearing going at this exact same time in Sunny Slope. So we have two council members who are in Sunny Slope, and this gives people an opportunity to see what's going on in other parts of the community, from the council and also from the community. And then there are minutes being taken and they're distributed as well. So if you'd like to speak, please fill out a card. I have 11 of those so far. Uh, and we'll take those all the way through and hear from you. When we get to the speaking time, you'll have about three minutes to speak and share your thoughts and ideas. And then staff will be around for the meeting as well if you want to get into more depth there. With that, we're going to show about an eight minute video overview. Uh, it gets in a high level of information that's in here. If you want to, again, if you want to dig deeper, this, this packet has more and then there's more on the So with that, we're going to go to the video. by the city manager for public review and comment. The city budget is about people and programs for a stronger Phoenix. Every year, the city prepares a trial budget. This process gives you, our residents, an opportunity to share your priorities and feedback on how tax dollars are spent. Three important points about this year's budget. It is balanced, which is required by law, and there is a surplus to allocate toward people and programs. Also, for the first time since the recession, ongoing revenues are equal to ongoing costs. We have a nearly $1.4 billion structurally balanced general fund budget thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council. These efforts have led to a projected surplus of $55 million, of which $35 million is in ongoing resources and $20 million is in one-time resources. Over the next several minutes, we'll provide you a high-level view of the recommendations for how that surplus could be spent. Approximately 70% of the surplus is proposed for employee compensation, and the remaining 30% is proposed for services and $5.5 million to continue investing in the Public Safety Pension Reserve Trust Fund to protect against unexpected downturns in investments. The 2019-20 trial budget continues to provide the core services residents expect. Chief among these is public safety. In addition, many 
recommendations are focused on improving neighborhoods, parks, libraries, support for outreach and services for people experiencing homelessness, additional street landscape maintenance, and preparations for the 2020 census. The city also continues to invest in maintaining the facilities you depend on and the fleet of vehicles that provide you everything from police response to street cleanups. Besides these proposals, we'll highlight expenditures that help the city address growth in construction and maintain the city's wastewater infrastructure. First, general fund recommendations. The general fund is made up of several different sources of revenue, including sales taxes, state shared revenue, and property taxes. Three-fourths of the general fund pays for police, fire, and courts, with a smaller portion, the remaining 25%, going for everything else, like libraries, parks, senior services, arts, and administrative and support functions. The primary focus of the general fund service additions is public safety across a wide array of departments. Here are some of the proposals. Eight new firefighter positions to provide 24-hour operations at Fire Station 55 at I-17 and Joe Max Road in North Phoenix. The creation of one new fire department crisis intervention unit and in the police department, the escalation training and community response services support for officer-involved shootings. These recommendations are based on public feedback from last year's budget process and the city's traumatic incident intervention resources ad hoc committee. Another key area of public safety funding is focused on improving police support processes, using civilian staff to free up police officers' valuable time for calls and service. First, the addition of 10 civilian positions to support a federally mandated transition to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting National Incident Base Reporting System. And second, the addition of 13 positions to streamline police booking procedures and create two new centralized booking centers to get officers back on the street faster. The trial budget also provides funding for increased inspection capacity to ensure buildings are meeting fire safety codes. Other public safety allocations, public defender representation for veterans and individuals with mental illness, in human services, add a caseworker and a vehicle to provide mobile victim advocacy. Security guard staffing at every library. Technology funding for cybersecurity to protect the city's infrastructure. In all, the trial budget proposes spending an additional $6.5 million on these and other public safety additions. Now, let's look at where you live. Investments in programs to strengthen neighborhoods. First, the budget would allocate approximately $1 million to add staff to work with neighborhood groups, to clean up blight, work with nearby businesses, and improve response times for neighborhood issues. Parks and Recreation would see eight new park ranger positions to increase patrol coverage in neighborhood and urban parks for a cost of about $1.1 million. Street transportation and public works would support neighborhoods by transitioning staff from a temporary to permanent status to clean up encampments and washes and right away for a cost of $970,000. Historic preservation would also get $75,000 to support historic property preservation. In all, neighborhood revitalization would see an additional $3.5 million in funding. Next, community services additions restore some desired programs to strengthen the community and expand other resident requests, including restoration of Sunday library hours at four branches means all libraries will be open to provide greater access to in-demand books, movies, classes, and programs for library patrons of all ages. Expand the Phoenix Teens program for youth at 10 city sites providing youth programs six days per week at a cost of $448,000. Providing case management assistance for homeless seniors and grant funding for arts organizations for youth and underserved communities would also be included. 
The budget would also add $1.3 million for long-standing street landscape maintenance needs, increasing frequency of maintenance from three to four times per year. New this year, a proposal to allocate funding to implement participatory budgeting or other projects in city council districts. Lastly, the city will invest in outreach to encourage residents to take part in the 2020 census. Given the move to digital form submission this census, the additional funds will help to ensure hard to count and hard to reach populations participate so that Phoenix gets its fair share of the approximately $866 million in annual revenues allocated through federal programs for public safety, transportation, housing, and human services. Overall, added general fund expenditures outlined in the trial budget total $55.2 million and would add 131 positions to strengthen our people, programs, services, and infrastructure. Moving on to propose non-general fund additions for a variety of services. Strengthening our street transportation department with 11 positions added or converted to full-time for a variety of services to support increasing work in the right of way and the recently expanded street maintenance funding in the capital improvement program budget, $768,000. Water services will see 21 positions and approximately $2.9 million in funding to keep up with demand at the department's 91st Avenue treatment site, the state's largest. The site is currently treating 180 million gallons of water a day for more than 2.5 million residents in five cities. Finally, 19 positions for planning and development to address increasing construction demand including reduction of turnaround times for pre-application submittals and complex commercial architectural plans. Added staff to ensure adherence to fire system requirements and ADA accessibility codes, and to maintain a 24-hour turnaround time for residential inspections. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about the 2019-20 trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details of the budget pamphlet available at one of our 19 community budget hearings and online at phoenix.gov slash budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at a public meeting or via email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. You can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. Thank you for being part of this important process. Good evening, how are you? I always enjoy uh, starting my budget meetings because uh, I seem to be the one that gets the most uh, activity, which I take pride in that because that means my constituents, or not mine, our constituents are, are active and engaged within the city. So I will start with speaker card number one, Ms. Donna Reiner. Ms. Pastor, Mr. Zucker, other staff, and fellow citizens. As I said this morning, because I went to one budget hearing already, this is one of the favorite times of the year. I know it's weird, but it's a time I get to see people. I feel like I actually have a say in the process, and sometimes things happen. So, I am fully supporting the trial budget. Don't get me wrong, it's, I, I want more things for parks and for um, arts and for historic preservation and for libraries and for seniors and public safety. However, I found one glaring omission and that has to do with the capital improvement maintenance for public art. Yes. Now, as the vice president of the Friends of Phoenix Public Art, which is a nonprofit organization, 
One of our functions is to help raise funds to assist with this process, but we can't do everything. So what we need to think about is that capital improvement project maintenance for public art is part of our investment our community has made for over 30 years. And if we don't keep up the maintenance, we will suffer from some of the things that happened, like burn bar. Maintenance is important to keep up on a steady process. And partly because Phoenix has one of the best public art programs in the nation, thanks to its willingness to commit 1% to the capital improvement projects, which some of those projects may be coming again, and therefore we're going to have more capital um, public art. But we need to make sure that we continue to support this innovative spirit in incorporating art into the design of much of the infrastructure, like public um, pedestrian overpasses. And uh, you know what goes well there? We're going to have some uh, public safety issues there. So what I want to say is thank you for everything that you have given in the past for maintenance. But I believe that we should continue to increase that amount. And as I mentioned this morning, I'm not greedy. I could ask for a lot, but I'm willing to ask for a mere $25,000 to add to the pool that we have been adding to over the last, I think, has that been four years now? And um, that will help us. That should be a minimum. And thank you very much for allowing me to speak. And I know I did not promise you didn't want to see me here asking the same thing. Um, that's what you said last year, Ms. Spencer. But we need more money. It's important. It's pay me now or pay me a heck of a lot later. So thank you. I uh, just want to say, uh, interesting that uh, we were talking about art maintenance because this afternoon that's specifically what I was talking about. Uh, in particular, uh, the pots on the 51 that need uh, to be, uh, I don't know what the term is, uh, uh, need some love. And so uh, I was speaking to the art director today regarding that and the maintenance. The other dynamic is we'll be voting on two projects tomorrow uh, regarding art, and uh, one with uh, Terminal 3, and then the other one, the well sites. And then before I said I, uh, that I was in agreement with it, I said I want to know if there's a maintenance plan. And so for the future projects, there seemed to be a maintenance plan. So, I hear you. Uh, Mario Romero. Next, and then after that, it's Chris Palmer. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Uh, good evening. My name is Mario Romero, and my address is 2701 North 7th Avenue. I'm a local real estate broker. I'm also one of the newer, newest commissioners on the Arts, Phoenix Arts and Culture Commission. Personally, I've grown up in the Valley. I've seen the city grow from where it was in the late 60s, early 70s, to the city it's now, that it is now. I mean, we're, we've become, we've gone from a, a, tier, a C tier city to an A city. I mean, everything is here, and it's vibrant and very exciting what's going on. So I hope we can continue with that. And as far as the council, I'd like to thank them, because we appreciate the level of support in the, our, in the trial budget. We're thankful for the additional 25,000 increase, from last year in the grant's budget to invest in risk communities and youth, and the $100,000 allocated for public art maintenance, which is still shy of $25,000 we need, but it's a good start. I believe that the arts help to sustain a healthy cultural workforce and it assists in making Phoenix a great place to live, work, and visit. And remember, the arts create jobs and jobs support local businesses, which is very important. <clears throat> we appreciate the modest increases in support to the arts grants program, 
since the recession hit, it was a very tough time for our city. With some of these funds, we're able to make Phoenix a vibrant hub for creative industries. And then other cities of similar population grant programs are double what our program is. And our closest competitor having a grant making budget of $1.7 million, so we should be close to that with a population of 1.7 million people. That's only a dollar uh, per capita spending on arts and culture and grant funding annually. We live in an amazing city to be proud of, and we've done some incredible things, and we have incredible things happening. But to really recruit and retain businesses, the arts and culture community has to be very strong. And along with that, we get education, which plays a big role for the early childhood, veterans, communities, and creative aging. So, Let's keep moving in the positive direction we're in for the coming years. And again, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Chris Palmer. Good evening. Uh, Chris Palmer, I'm from the Garfield neighborhood, which is a neighborhood right next to downtown Phoenix. I'm actually here to talk about uh, 13th Street from Van Buren up to Moreland Street. Uh, over a decade ago, we as a city actually commissioned an analysis of that street uh, because of all the complaints you get when you have an urban city street with no gutters and no curbs, no real drainage. It's just a strip of asphalt that rises and falls every time it crosses another street. Uh, and has dirt on both sides where my neighbors park. Um, it's been over a decade since that was uh, commissioned. Nothing's happened. That's, that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, I've got lots of stories from my neighbors. Uh, you guys know what happens when it rains here. The streets all flood, and there are no gutters, and there is no drainage, so the water goes into the houses. Uh, we have other stories of neighbors who park in front of their house and get ticketed by the police because the parking on a non dust proof surface, which is our city street because we haven't finished painting. Uh, that's all kind of absurd, and that's why I'm here and why my neighbors want me here. Uh, the thing that really kind of gets me, though, is the Garfield Elementary School. Uh, anybody want to guess what street their main entrance is on? It is on 13th Street. <laughs> uh, every day, uh, 600 kids come out of that school. They can look up, they can see downtown. You know, they can see the buildings, they can see the construction, they can see the money, they can see the cranes. They can see our city on the rise. And then they can look down and they can see their street. They can walk home in a cloud of dust because we haven't finished painting it. Or, if we're really lucky and it's raining, they can go through all the lakes of runoff water, which is just as clear as you might think it is. These kids know exactly the message that we, as a city, are sending to them. And during these budget hearings is where we, as a city, come together and we decide what it is we're going to stand for and what we're going to do. This is not a new problem. We've been talking about it for over a decade. We hope that this year, as a city, we're going to send a new message. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Eva Peters Adoni? It says no, it doesn't wish to speak. However, it says something about taxes. Increase, get rid of. <laughs> what would you want? You want a mic? I'll get you a mic. <laughs> and so does Ray. Ray doesn't want to speak either, but it says taxes. So I'm not sure uh, if. Uh... Okay. So I just need a little bit of an explanation. Or some content. Um, taxes are going to be with us no matter what. It's just um, how are our taxes being spent? Okay. I, I think that there needs to be more accountability on um, how we're being spent. Okay. Um, my answer to you would be that's the way participatory budgeting uh, will be rolling out for the next year. And participatory budget.
budget, budgeting, we'll be discussing uh, what the neighborhoods or what people want within their district. Um, we started very small because we were, were starting it. Um, each council, and it's very small, but each council will be receiving uh, 25000 uh, to be able to use for their participatory budgeting and bringing the community together such as this. So next year my budget meeting will be very different in the sense that we'll have more, we'll have tables and we'll be able to say, where would you like to see uh, this money go to? And so um, that's one of the ways where we're gonna start. Um, would you like to also uh, explain? Uh, that's one of the ways I'm trying to figure that, to solve that so that people have more uh, Participation within our budget, uh, and, and and be able to uh, say, I would like to see uh, these streets, or I would like to see uh, signs, and I'm going to pick a say historic neighborhoods because I hear this. Uh, I would like to see our signs replace our historic neighborhood signs, and so we're going to come up with a process for that to happen. But uh, I'm going to tell you, Councilman, <laughs> city city manager is super probably also. Now the council inspector is an item in here to, to really it's an exercise for the community to come together with our council member and talk about our priorities. So we have to that it's important uh, and then have some money to allocate to that, test that out, see how it works, and um, if, if it works well, we can uh, expand that in the future. Does that get to what you're talking about? Oh, part of it. I have never thought of it, so oh. wind and uh, are we going to start dealing with some of the blank that we have? And some of the the budget is there. So, so this, in the, in the current uh, city structure, we have primarily the Neighborhood Services Department works with blank. They have blank busters that work with neighborhoods. Okay. We have neighborhood specialists who work with neighbors to help figure that out. And we're adding two more neighborhood specialists to work with neighborhoods. We have inspectors who go out, and not everybody's happy about inspectors because inspectors can give out tickets. Oh, I'd love to be one. Okay, so we have we are moving some inspectors to be able to go all over the city uh, to to work on the blight issues that that are um, that are being raised. So sorry about that. So there's there's a there's several different ways in this budget that we work on on that. We also have some cleanup crews that help clean up. We have park rangers who are helping uh, keep things in the park uh, clean and safe for people to use the parks. So there's all sorts of ways in this that we're going to You know how uh, the gentleman, I think two times before, had said how long we've been in the valley. I've been here since 49. So I've seen a lot of work. Well, thank you for coming here to speak. You're welcome. Do you want to say anything? No? Set it off? Okay. I like how the team works. Uh, Steve Schumacher? Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor, City Manager Zucker. Uh, a little bit of, my name is Steve Schumacher, by the way. Uh, a little bit of a history lesson. What I'm going to talk about just for a couple minutes is the culture around the valley and Phoenix in particular around our history and our heritage and the pioneers of our, uh, our city. Uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, that time frame, a combination of the city of Phoenix, the Arizona Republic, some other sponsors, they, they really would put on major, major programs once a year to honor our pioneers and our history and our heritage. They would have two-day programs. There were special issues of the Arizona Republic. Uh, you can see those on um, in the Library of Congress website and so forth. And they did a great job of honoring our pioneers, everything from a plaque on the fountain at the, the, the old city hall to putting up markers around the state. Um, as a matter of fact, in the early 60s, again, a combination of the city, the state, various sponsors, Daughters of the American Revolution, some others, they installed a bunch of markers all around the, 
the state to identify certain historic spots around the state, and there were several of them in Phoenix. One of them, unfortunately, which honored uh, a lot of people considered Jack Swilling, the father of, uh, of the city of Phoenix, there was a marker honoring him and his colleagues at about 28th Street in Van Buren. And unfortunately, a late night driver demolished that marker. And the city crew went out, picked up all the pieces of it, put it wherever it was going to be put, and then it was completely forgotten and never to be seen again. And that was in about 2003. And unfortunately, uh, to me, that was indicative of, of a culture that really didn't honor its pioneers and its heritage and its uh, history as it had been done in the 20s and 30s. And thankfully, Mayor Williams, about six weeks ago, signed a proclamation making the month of March Phoenix Pioneers Month. And so thankfully, Mayor Williams has taken a major step in changing that culture back to one that really identifies its pioneers and its heritage and celebrates it. Now this is just a proclamation, it's a piece of paper, so there's a lot of other things that need to happen to make that culture shift. My proposal, uh, as, it, as it relates to the budget proposition, is that there be some funding uh, put forth to add to education and awareness efforts that myself and a number of all other volunteers have been doing around the valley uh, to include um, schools, uh, put, maybe part of the curriculum, Phoenix history, and that kind of stuff. So that's my proposition, is to provide some seed money for a, for a group, a public-private partnership, to really work on the culture of, uh, of Phoenix and bring it back around to what Mayor Williams wrote in the proclamation. So thank you. Thank you. And my understanding is that the HP Historic Preservation Department and the streets are working on that. Uh, Dan Clocky. Good evening. Thank you, Councilman Pastor, Mr. Zucker. Um, Dan Clocky, uh, resident of District 4, proud resident of District 4. Um, I'm here also as a member of the Historic Preservation Commission to say thank you. Uh, thank you for including funding in the budget um, and in the, the additional budget as well. Uh, it's great to see uh, us thinking about our historic uh, assets and heritage and so forth uh, and being able to put some funding to that. The second thing I'd like to ask about uh, and request funding for is around family reunification. Um, these are funds who would help people who are homeless uh, but have family and friends in other parts of the country that are willing to uh, have them stay with them. This is a program that is not new. This has been done uh, for many, many years with many of the great organizations here in town. Um, it's surprising how many people come to Phoenix looking for opportunity and something goes sideways and they wind up quickly in the streets without any funding. Those folks then can create so many different issues in terms of needs for housing and food and so forth that get very, very expensive. This kind of funding can be deployed by organizations like St. Vincent and Paul, obviously Craig Kripkin's here with CATS, um, that, that really have the staff and volunteers that can help reunite folks who are homeless here in the streets with family and friends. The issue is always how do you get people home? Um, and so this isn't about sticking a person on a bus and getting them to town. This is actually about um, trying to reunify folks. So the benefit of this is that it's very low cost. We're, we're, we're spending millions of dollars that are necessary to clean up the police and so forth. This is an opportunity, I think, to really help a portion, not all homeless people, but a portion of homeless people um, who, who are here and just are stuck. Um, so I would request, uh, and I'm a, a little bit more greedy, I guess, than Ms. Ryan, um, uh, half a million dollars um, to look at this program um, and to assist these organizations that do this. And if you think about it, a bus ticket or a plane ticket is going to cost you two or three hundred dollars. You could literally help probably 15 or 20 percent 
of the, uh, of the issues around homelessness here for a far greater or far less cost than some of these other programs that are critical for folks that are chronically homeless and need other assets and other resources. So I'd ask, as you're looking at the whole issues around homelessness, to consider this as sort of part of the whole um, repertoire of ways that we can alleviate this situation. So thank you. So my understanding uh, around homelessness, I'm not <coughs> part of the, the collective group that is working on this, uh, but my understanding is that there is a collective group working on uh, solving uh, affordable housing, uh, looking at affordable housing. Um, also, there's a group of seeing what type of solutions can come about in wraparound services. Obviously, there are wraparound services uh, happening at this moment. I do believe that some of our nonprofits are being kind of pushed and pulled in many which ways, uh, not only in homeless, but in other areas uh, of need right now that is happening with, uh, uh, with our country. And so uh, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, I do know that a lot of people from the nonprofit, from the private world, and from the development world, uh, they are coming together to try to solve solutions. Uh, and rumors You don't want to speak? Homelessness and uh, police law enforcement funding. Just to get it on the record. Craig Trickman. And then after that, it's Ruth Ann. Thank you very much. appreciative of that. I want to tell you, I guess, basically four points. Number one, we have done our part this last year. We've increased private fundraising by 78%, which is almost $500,000. We've increased support from other regional cities. And I know that's a very important point for this council and this city by 53%. Uh, accomplishments this year, and I'll just be very quick. We've got private grants for two senior navigators, and for West Side housing navigators, we acquired a building in Glendale uh, we to, to provide a service platform out there. Uh, we have served 529 individuals in our family shelter and our child care program has got a five star rating. We are facing increased financial burdens that are not controllable by us. The United Way is cutting us by $236,000 for next year. That's a minimum number that they've told us. It's not just for us, it's pretty much across the board cut that they're doing. Uh, general salaries and benefits, which again, we can't control because of the minimum wage and benefits, cost, insurance costs, that's sort of up $110,000. And importantly, the human services campus is looking to charge us rent proportional to our size on the campus, which I have some fairness objections to, but that is going to be at the least $200,000. In fact, they're saying quite a bit more in terms of what would cost the campus. Uh, we feel that that's <coughs> the anchor of the campus as opposed to the, to the world of small business. Lastly, increasing effectiveness for next year. Uh, we want to open the Ramsey Norton Colonial Success Center. We want to up, have up to 10 beds for medically, for chronically medical senior needs medical senior and others needing chronic medical services uh, because there's a lot of people that, that need regular chronic medicine. We want to pilot a hospital pro uh, patient release program handoff so that we don't have the problem of hospitals going up. And we're working with a couple of hospitals on that right now and funding for that. We're seeking resources and sources to support our, and build a West Valley senior shelter. We're working on eviction program, GED, that sort of thing. I say those things to, you to get to my last point, which is number one, I'd like the city of Phoenix to contribute half of what our uncontrollable deficit is. And that's $258,000. Number two, we will privately raise the second half. We're doing our part. And number three, we need partial relief from what is now sort of a fee for, not sort of, a fee for service model with the sick and in our contract. We need a model for flexible and minimal funding. So all these things, in fact, all our, 
all of the things I mentioned to you as initiatives for next year are not fundable out of the money we currently get from the city. So we are not, the, the money we get doesn't encourage us to be nimble and flexible in the future. And we really need to sit on that score. Thank you very much. I'm going to close. Thank you. Do you want to talk about So Phoenix uh, provides the greatest part of uh, it. Relative to other cities in the valley, Phoenix provides the greatest amount and percentage of its general fund budget to serve homelessness. But clearly, there's more need than we are able to provide. We all see that every day, living and working here in central Phoenix. So the need's overwhelming. Uh, as the councilman said, it really has to be a regional effort. And, and a lot of this needs to be done with the state and the county and have the responsibility for mental health and public health services. It's not a city function, it's a county and a state function. But the impact of it falls to the residents of cities, and so the council has been responding to that over the last several years in terms of what we're doing on budget. Um, but clearly there's more that we need to do. There's need on the human services campus, there's need on all of the community, and something we've got, we got to continue to work on. There's, there's no one solution. We've heard some suggestions tonight, and the implication of something that's tried in other, other cities. Um, clearly, the needs of the human services campus with the whole, the whole model needs some work, and uh, so we will continue to work on it. Thank you for that. My name is Ruth Ann Marston. I live in Willow. I am currently promoting the 150th birthday of the first school district in the state of Arizona, which is Phoenix Elementary. So, just so you know where I'm coming from, uh, Mr. Zerker, Councilman Castor, I, I want to tell you that I'm standing up here thinking the city of Phoenix is doing better than I ever thought would be possible for it to do given the expansion that we're witnessing and the myriad of problems that come with it. But I want to second the request for maintenance of the public arts. I want to ask for doubling of the additional funding for historic preservation because you don't have anything in there for historic preservation grants. And well, I like the historic reports and the, the history coming forward to us. I know that maintenance and historic buildings is important. And you know, and I know that nobody comes to Phoenix to see McDonald's and Jack in the Box because they can see in San Antonio or the Yukon, for Pete's sake, or maybe even China. They come to see this kind of history. I see Michelle Dodds back there. I think she's a wonderful historic preservation officer. She comes every month to the Phoenix Historic uh, Community meetings. She doesn't have to come. She comes every month and she reports, and we know what's happening. But if you look at this building, which was built around 1899, and two miles north of town, McDowell was the border. All you have to do is be in here to know the importance of historic buildings. This building has preserved and it tells us all kinds of things. We need to maintain our historic buildings. Even with the Phoenix Cares program, which I absolutely think is going to make a huge difference. We need to maintain those buildings now so we don't create areas that invite people to come in because people who own those buildings can't afford the upkeep. Thank you, Ruthann. So, um, in terms of art maintenance, the City Council has increased the budget from zero to $100,000 in the last three years. There's been a lot of advocacy. About we that. have a lot of art projects that have reached that point. Right, and there's a lot, you know, bridges and, and other things. So we're going to we continue to work on how we can take care of the art. 
In terms of HP um, historic preservation, it's really interesting. The last bond program we had was almost 14 years ago. Uh -huh. And there was a historic preservation component of that, and we're coming to the end of those funds. So you're seeing you're seeing that uh, the the impact of running out of that. And so and the impact of not being able to designate. And so we've got to think now about what's the next bond program and what sorts of things need to go in there. We have significant maintenance needs in there. But we just have a surplus now and we have a need now. So I'm advocating that you double that additional budget. I uh, understand. In terms of the big, historically, buildings like this and historic preservation throughout the city, have, have the big projects have been done with historic preservation bond funds. And so again, we're getting that point where we've got to start talking if about I can what's help. the next one. Give me a call. You always do. Thank you. All right. Happy Heart. And then after that, Jasmine uh, Bessa. Councilwoman Pastor and City Manager Gerber and members of advocates for, for Phoenix. I want to first of all say thank you for having the, these hearings. There's no other government that I'm aware of in Arizona that goes to the length that the City of Phoenix does to hold hearings for people to come and advocate, and I appreciate that. Uh, I also want to thank you for the additional funds for libraries. I'm here to talk about libraries. I'm a member of the Board of Friends of the Library. We raise funds to put on hundreds of programs in uh, the city libraries every year, and we can't put them on if they're closed. So thank you very much for the funds uh, and the trial budget to open up four libraries on Sundays. It is a giant step toward getting us back to 2010's funding before the cuts. And uh, I will point out that we still have some branches that are closed on Fridays and Mondays. So we're not done yet, and we appreciate your support on that. Thank you for the uh, funds to help uh, with the other library issues that are in the trial. Um, I do want to say that we are also uh, supportive of the other cultural areas, the arts and, and uh, the other cultural areas that make a city great. And as you're looking at bonds, I hope you won't look at just police and fire, although we're supportive of police and fire. We also think that culture makes the city great. Um, I just wanted to also ex uh, say to you that the libraries um, do a lot for uh, helping with public safety issues by providing programs for children, by providing computers for people who don't have computers and who need access to those sorts of services and a whole lot of other areas. So thank you for what you've done. We look forward to you doing more and uh, we appreciate your support for library. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. So uh, you pointed out that libraries now, every library will be open on Sunday. We do still have uh, every library except Burton Bar and South Mountain have one day of closure, either a Friday or a Monday. So that's the next frontier is to start getting hours restored back on Friday or Monday, depending on the branch. Jackson? On behalf of my community, um, I believe arts and culture should be more heavily invested in. Um, in this year's proposal, the arts and culture funding is being cut in half from $8 million to $400 million. Um, meanwhile, for example, the funding for police is being increased by $2.5 million. Um, if you guys weren't aware, our police are the deadliest in the country, and instead of investing in something useful for our city and our youth, the proposed budget is helping the Phoenix Police Department continue to kill more and more people. Uh, just because you're not impacted by this issue doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, I hope you realize that you're here to help our communities and not harm them. Thank you. Can I just clarify for a second? You said arts is cut from $8 million to $4 million? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, I'm not sure how that got translated and stuff up. I want to make sure I understand. Um, okay. So we had some significant maintenance issues in some of our city-owned facilities, like the city owns the art museum, the Phoenix Theater, um, the science museum, the city actually owns those buildings. We invested a significant amount of money to repair some fire systems and some sprinkler systems and other things that we learned about in our library. So that was, that was a big amount of money we put into the buildings, but in terms of operating the arts, we have not reduced that. So thank, thank you. Well, there are also that. other places that that money could be placed in besides police and um, like police and fire. So regardless of that, yeah. there should still not be that amount of money added to the police budget. I, I understand. I understand your point. I didn't want to dispute your point. I just wanted to make sure I understood the eight to the four, and I think it has to do with the facilities. So I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. I just wanted to be clear that we didn't cut that out. <laughs> uh, did I eat better? Yeah, so I'll have to figure out what happened in this. It would have been capital uh, money that we used to fix those buildings. My guess is what it is is we want to fix other city facilities uh, because we, we, we've done largely what we have to do with our park, park facilities. And so that money will then go to fix other buildings. But, but I've got to figure that out for sure. We'll get back to it. Let me explain. Capital funding is used for maintenance and building. So there's different pots of funding. And in the different pots of funding, uh, there are specific guidelines as to what you can use that funding for. So what I'm hearing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is capital funds were used to repair and repair uh, art buildings or some maintenance uh, that was needed. And I'm sure this, uh, what it came out of is there was a maintenance report regarding all our buildings. And we use capital funding uh, that is used for building. Uh, capital funding cannot be used for any other area other than the maintenance of buildings. So there's, there's different funding streams as to what gets funded and where it gets funded. Even if it wasn't like cut out, I think um, that arts and culture is really important to use and to go well, actually to all of our communities. Um, for example, just the other day I was um, looking at art classes um, to take because I really like photography and um, there for an art class that lasts about a month, only like two hours um, per for like session, like which is one day a week, was um, $150, which coming from like a low income family, um, is, and being used, like that would be something I would want to pay, not have my parents pay for me. Um, it's completely unacceptable. I think that there should be more money being put into youth, which are the ourselves and I think we need to think about that more and 
especially with the $55 million surplus from the budget last year, I think there is more than enough like money, at least even a small portion of that money, to go to work. And culture, I think that we should be putting more money into um, invest, like investing in people instead of criminalization of our Thank you. Um, I just want to mention that uh, through uh, the budget hearing and through the process last year, uh, a traumatic intervention committee was uh, formalized and it was asked, uh, the community asked for us to uh, formalize a traumatic intervention committee. It's an ad hoc committee that uh, I chaired along with Councilman Nowakowski uh, because of the concerns in the neighborhood and uh, regarding, uh, regarding <coughs> police shootings and the crisis that happened and police shootings uh, face uh, during that moment and when the community faces. And so uh, we added funding uh, through the committee, the Q, uh, committee, uh, there was funding added for a crisis intervention. And uh, $550,000 was uh, dedicated to crisis intervention because through that committee we realized where there were gaps. We had crisis intervention, but we needed more on uh, what was happening within the community. So that was added uh, to the budget. Uh, and then in addition to that, there was some other funding added with this uh, to, camp to, police. to police. And it was added, uh, added to police crisis intervention team also. And so there's a number of areas where uh, public safety uh, money was added for those reasons because of uh, some of the, because of the police shootings that were happening and some of the crisis that the community was facing. And so uh, that was from the good work of community members uh, within the area that requested this. So I'd like to thank them for uh, the next, uh, Maribel Lopez. <coughs> Here in Phoenix, we have the deadliest police department in the country. Yet Phoenix continues to dump money into the Phoenix Police Department. The Police Department is the single largest expense in the general funds. An additional $2.5 million from taxpayer money is unacceptable. Until the Phoenix Police Department takes steps to correct that violence and bring in accountability, we need to stop dumping endless amounts of money into the deadliest police in the country. Well, there are neighborhoods in the community that still don't even have their most basic necessities. We demand a freeze on any new taxpayer money for the police until our communities are equally funded. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Helm. Hello. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Pastor and Mr. Zerker. My name is Lisa Helm, and I live in Malo. And one of our biggest concerns, as you well know, is traffic, uh, speeding, wrong-way traffic, cut-through traffic, and dangerous conditions along 3rd Avenue and 5th Avenue as people are rushing to and from downtown. Uh, we are particularly concerned because of the increases in development north, north of Thomas, and uh, ask that the city provide adequate planning and funding to complete the design that was started uh, between <coughs> McDowell and Van Buren and extended north of McDowell. And um, also, we the, the Willow Board has submitted a plan, the Vision 3.5 plan, showing our preferences for having only one lane of traffic through there and increasing multimodal traffic uh, to improve the safety for pedestrians and bicycles. Um, so 
we would strongly urge the city to, to consider that plan. And also, uh, I'd like to thank the city for the many improvements that we have received in Willow, particularly in terms of, of traffic safety. But point out that these improvements go extend far beyond our neighborhood. We are a, a primary corridor connecting uh, pedestrians, bicycles, cars to light rail, to numerous businesses in, in the central area, uh, St. Joseph's Hospital, other schools, services, government offices, and believe that this is a, a, an outstanding opportunity to make this corridor uh, an exemplary multi uh, corridor. Thank you. So, um, and I don't know who's here for transportation, uh, but uh, there is a plan, there's been a plan ever since uh, I entered office, maybe two, yeah, two years, uh, ever since I entered office for a holistic uh, view from Jefferson all the way up to uh, Camelback and third of connectivity. Uh, there, the process is going in phases, so uh, phase one is happening currently uh, all the way up to Roosevelt, and then from Roosevelt to go to McDowell, and from McDowell all the way up to, uh, I want to say Osborne. And so uh, there, are, this is happening in phases, uh, and funding is designated in phases, and so uh, that's just, that's, that's what I know from the transportation department as I keep pushing. Uh, as growth, growth is going to continue, as you can see. Uh, we are the fifth largest city, and uh, we have a lot of infill properties that right now are being looked at, and it, for whatever reason, I feel like we're at peak in development, and you are going to see more and more happening within the central uh, I have asked uh, planning, and I probably should ask uh, transportation. Uh, I would like to see a holistic plan for the Central Corridor as different uh, streets are adjusted or changed. Uh, as we try to slow down traffic, what that means is other streets then become full of traffic, which then, then that means frustration happens, cut through traffic then begins. And so uh, it's not only happening in the Willow neighborhood, but it's happening all across the Central Corridor and specifically in Midtown and Uptown. Uh, and you will see more and more of that conversation as I'm hearing more and more of it. And so I am asking uh, planning and transportation to take a look uh, at the at the core and uh, how are we going to manage it as we grow. Uh, the Third Street Promenade is happening also. Third Street Promenade is uh, moving and with, with Third Street Promenade is connectivity from uh, Indian Steel here and as you take Third Street all the way down to downtown. And so you will also see Third Street going, uh, becoming a one lane. Uh, there's a lot of questions going on about it because with the growth happening, what's that going to look like and what's that now going to put, what type of stresses is it going to put on uh, other major issues and arterials? So these are the questions uh, that are being asked by me because I'm one that's not yet uh, at that point I, uh, of riding my bike or uh, taking a bus. Uh, I still am dependent on my car because I like my independence. However, uh, my kids are very different from me and uh, they like uh, light rail and they continue to want to take the bus and, and connectivity and so uh, they also want to ride their bike. And uh, so you can see a different generation. I, I guess I'm getting at that age and getting old where there is a generational gap happening within my own family. but. I do understand, because I say I am in the middle of the bubble, uh, that that's where the future is going and how do we build for the future. And so what does that look like and how do we make it safe for everybody? So, uh, so I'm in the bubble. 
trying to transition in both worlds. Yeah. All right, Patrick. So I initially want to talk about one specific thing, but really quick, the video that you showed raised an issue for me. Um, when I talk about clearing out encampments, and as some of these activists over here, who I was super happy that they were here to speak their minds and mention, we have a policing problem. And I did see in the video that it did say that we were going to have uh, crisis prevention training as well as de-escalation training. Very good thing. My biggest question about that is, is are we still going to allow officers before they've taken those things to interact with the homeless population who in mass are one of the largest populations in the city with mental health issues and in a lot of cases are people who are uh, in already disadvantaged communities aside from being homeless. So that, that's my biggest concern with that is I'm worried about officers dealing with people before they've had the proper training because as we've seen in the last year, it, has very deadly uh, consequences. And I wanted to know what your thoughts are on that before I move to the main thing I want to speak about. So our officers have a variety of training when they need. Of course, when they come on the force, but throughout, um, throughout the year, my understanding is that each officer has had some de-escalation training and some, I'm not sure if everyone has had crisis intervention training, but the chief is committed to getting that through to everyone. The, the bottom line, you raise a great point, is officers can't choose who they interact with yeah. in the moment, right? And so that's part of the police officer's job is to respond to the emergency. We want them to be fully trained in as broad an array as possible. Not always, not always uh, practical to have done that, but that is part of what the council I'm talking about is bringing that training, more hours of that training to all of our officers uh, and, and to do that. But it, being a police officer is a tough job because they have to know so many things about so many different issues. And as you said, that mental health issues in, this, in that community are severe. And so we're trying to get as much training as possible. But we have 3,000 officers to train. It takes a little, a little while. Sure. That's and um, I'll just I'll also add for everyone is that, um, yes, that's true. Clearing out encampments is an emergency. It's a planned activity. And so if that's something that we're going to keep doing, let's not. Um, do that until we, at one, at least have a more suitable place to move people to because a lot of people are homeless, not because they choose to be, actually no one's homeless because they choose to be. And so also, just on that specifically, sure. so that, that's a great point, that the, the, the planned teams, the Phoenix Cares team that goes and deals with that is supposed to be the team that's trained okay. to do that. Okay. And, uh, you know, we all, I, I agree, I'm not saying that every police officer is officer is, is bad, but and we all hear the, the bad apples argument, but the problem is until the city and the department starts holding these bad apples accountable, the good deeds they do gets overshadowed. And I feel that that hasn't happened enough. Um, but, but the main thing I wanted to speak to you about before is the video, uh, Councilman Pastor, you were just speaking about it, was your children who prefer more public transit than going by car. I'm surely not their age, but uh, I also prefer public transit by, than car. And for those of you in the room who don't know, on March 20th, the day before we got a new mayor, the city council, she voted no, let's be very clear, but the city council voted yes to cancel the uh, light rail extension that was gonna go on Camelback from 19th to, I believe, 43rd Avenue. And I, I served on several boards who rely on donations and things like that, and those are obviously different from taxes. But I bring that up because I understand that like, you have a general fund of someone donates to whatever you want, that, then you can. But if you have specific money that you ask for, like, we're going to do this, and then you maybe want to change what you're going to do with that money, you should either ask the donors, or if the donors approve it, then that's okay. If not, you should give it back. So we voted in 2015 for, or I believe it was 2015, for Prop 104 for the light rail extension. So my question is, is that if voters choose not to use that tax dollars for the light rail, can we have it back? You mean, can uh, you have a tax? Can we sure. The tax? We, we voted for a light rail extension that got canceled without our permission. And either I, I feel we should have a light rail extension. I want more of it. I want much better public transit. But if that money, 
that we've been getting taxed on for about four years now isn't going to go to that, I think we deserve to have it back. So, um, I would say I would love to give it back to you. Um, however, what we voted on, or uh, what I didn't vote on, uh, what others voted on is for that money to go to street maintenance. And so, uh, that's actually a good question for the future. Uh, I probably have some ideas for you, uh, but uh, so that money has been allocated to uh, street maintenance. Uh, don't really know how to really answer your question, but I believe the answer would be no. Yeah, I think uh, it's just we also have an so, election in August, everyone, so, where if one of those propositions passes, all future library extensions are killed by a charter regrant. I think we all need to be aware of that. It's going to be on August 11th, if I'm not mistaken. 27th, excuse me. Um, we need to get out and vote this down because four years ago we spoke by double digit margins saying that we wanted this. As Councilwoman Pastor said, we're building for the future. And again, I'm, Councilwoman Pastor has the honor of being the only council person here, and she did vote no on this, so forgive me, I don't want to see that okay. happen. Okay. But this was taken from us without our permission, and it has been allocated for other things. But as I mentioned, in any organization I've ever been into, that when people give you money for a specific purpose and you don't use it, they want it back. I don't want the money back. I want the, I want the light. But if we're not going to get it, I want the money back. So, thank you. So, um, speaking about the light rail, since you brought it up, I will uh, get on my And the statement is true that uh, West, the West extension has been, uh, they say delayed, but really has been killed. I think there's really a, a bigger master plan if you really kind of, if we go back and start seeing conversations, uh, now that I'm putting the path together, uh, it started with the North extension, and the North extension, we, we delayed that that's really where the, the, the conversation started. The other conversation started is when uh, South Central, uh, when the community uh, started, and I want to say it was a good two years that they asked to have uh, conversations about the four lanes versus two lanes. That really, that really opened up or created a crack. And uh, created a crack in the sense that others that did not want light rail realized they were going to enter. <laughs> and so I believe that ultimately there's always been a plan to kill light rail. It was just a matter of how it was going to be framed and come about. As we know, light rail is very important. Uh, light rail is very important because it provides access to uh, many. Light rail uh, provides access to students to have the ability to go to ASU, go downtown, have the ability to get a job, go where the jobs are, has the ability to transfer uh, those uh, that need, that cannot drive, uh, able to go to Ability 360 and get their uh, physical therapy. Uh, light rail also helps uh, seniors uh, get to and from doctor's appointment, but also get to uh, senior centers or just their socialization. Light rail also gives access to everyone. So what does that mean? Everyone has access to light rail. That means that sometimes people get on the light rail and end up in different neighborhoods and then there's questions as to why they're in my neighborhood. Um, I think I, I like rail is necessary. I think it adds diversity, it adds culture, it adds livelihood and viability within our city. And so we have invested as a city and the federal government has invested millions of dollars that we need to protect uh, because if we don't protect it and go out and vote for it, not only will we not have the extensions, but we won't have the maintenance in the city of Phoenix for 
like that. You have to remember we're connected to other cities. Other cities are then impacted by it. So this is not just the city of Phoenix. This is a regional issue that we all have to be participated in. So it will be a great lift. It will be a major campaign that needs to happen quickly. And uh, you will probably see your, uh, every one of us that supports Light Rail start to play what I call the game. And so, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Eduardo Finn? No? See? Have been? Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Eduardo Pim, and I live in District 4, uh, right off 43rd Avenue and in Canada. And I, I've heard a lot of stuff about arts and culture tonight, and I fully support that. I just wanted to go on the record, but I don't, I don't see much people from my community here, so I'm here to represent my community in that side of District 4. And uh, talking to my community, I've learned that the budget process is, you guys need to be better at the budget process. Uh, these, these seats should be packed, and you guys should have a quota to fill these seats and reach out to all parts of your districts. Um, because there, there's problems in our communities that we're not hearing about tonight. And um, you guys give us two weeks, or yeah, like two weeks, two and a half weeks of, of meetings in, in very little time for our, every member of the community to come out and participate in these things. And I don't know when you guys start going over the trial budget, but two weeks is not enough for the community to put their input. So um, I know someone mentioned earlier about Phoenix having a, a better process in other cities, but I, I think uh, it's a very low bar for saying we, we, we need to raise a higher bar if we are doing better than other cities already. Um, but uh, with, with that, I want to say that uh, the trauma victim fund of for police crisis violence, intervention. Crisis intervention, yes. Uh, I do support that. I, I would like to see that on the final budget. Um, and so, uh, so do my community members that I have talked to. And um, one thing that concerned me on, on the budget uh, presentation was the encampments and the gentleman that was uh, before we talked about it too. Uh, the encampments, when when you guys say encampment cleanup, what what is it? What does that look like when there's someone still there? Um, because that that is their home. So I don't know. I know you said Phoenix cares is, is going to be part of that cleanup process. Is that what the, did I hear correctly? Um, yeah. So I, I would like some funds to go and to more services for them, um, affordable housing, mental health, uh, things of that nature that can help them instead of criminalize them because I don't know what's going to happen if they, if that's their only home, I wouldn't want to be kicked out of my home. So I don't know if at that point our um, beloved police officers would then come and uh, who knows what. Um, so that, that's all I have to say today, but I uh, do support the, the uh, crisis interventions and um, and the arts and culture, but I would like to see a better uh, budget process. Thank you. So I appreciate your comments. Uh, uh, understand I want a better budget process. We are uh, working on that. Uh, as for the trial budget, the trial budget needs to begin talking about the budget in, I want to say December, but I feel like it's really early. The budget process really begins in January and February with a look ahead for five years. The trial budget did come out uh, two weeks ago, and we have these hearings all the way through April, and then the council will um, start to vote on the final budget at the end of May. So th there, is a, there is a time period, but uh, I understand the desire for more input. We're working on some things uh, with an online budgeting tool. We want to keep working with uh, Padera and others on as the councilman said, we do have the participatory budgeting fund in this to do some work on, on a pilot basis on council district by council district. Thank you for your input. Okay, 
Richard. You're up. Richard. Thank you, Councilman Pastor, uh, City Manager Zerker. My name is Richard David Yarte. I live at 4521 North 19th Place in Phoenix. And I came to uh, support uh, the trial budget and thank you for any number of support for historic preservation and the libraries uh, as well. And in Highland Estates, where I live, I know everyone complains about uh, potholes, but uh, just in the last year, we've had Osborne, Campbell, uh, Missouri, uh, 20th Street, all have been repaved and they look terrific. The median on 20th Street. Uh, so we have no complaints. Uh, we have a good neighborhood association gal. So, uh, so we're pleased. I thought I would take uh, a jump off comments that Ruth and Marston made about uh, historic preservation and the bond issue. Uh, in uh, last month, the city council approved uh, uh, the first steps towards a 2020 bond election uh, for uh, unmet needs in capital for police and fire. We support that. Uh, I think that the, the uh, Police have many structures that need uh, upgrade and, and new investment. And, uh, and a bond issue is, is, is a one-time expenditure that can, that can last for uh, years and years and impacts far beyond just something that we can remember. Uh, in 2006, which was the last time we had a bond issue, 13, 14 years ago, that was for about 875 million. And quite a lot of it was for ASU, a state-funded uh, issue, and, and downtown. That has been a resounding of, of success. Yet, it, the city got some complaints early about what are we spending money for ASU. Well, at the time, uh, <clears throat> at the time, the state was not interested in helping ASU that way. It, uh, and, and look at the tremendous uh, success that, that that bond issue has, has uh, 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 made for the city and for ASU in that, in that time period. Uh, we support the, the bond issue, but this city it has 1.6 million people. It, it's a 500 square miles. We need a much more expanded bond issue than, than just police and fire. Uh, there will be a recession, and that's exactly when you need to have that money dedicated through the cop property tax to, 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 for in major unmet needs in infrastructure. Remember, the county built a court tower and a, a, a sheriff's headquarters during the middle of the recession, when precisely the, the uh, uh, commodity prices and labor and, and, uh, and bidding is favorable. It's called countercyclical uh, investment, and uh, it's a good thing. It makes the city better. This is a wonderful opportunity to do very good for generations. Thank you. So I believe, and Ed, you can tell me the process, uh, that we will be having a discussion in the future about adding items uh, to the model. <laughs> Currently, the council's appointed a bond committee focused on public safety, but the council can appoint uh, more people. Uh, and also, the, the ultimate charge is up to the council when it comes to back from the committee. How quickly do we need to, uh, I guess, 
Is it for the August or is it for November? So state law requires bond, bonds to only be on a November ballot. So it's either November of 19, which is probably not possible to do the process, or November of 2020. So there's enough time there's to enough add time. more uh, members and add more committees. There's a lot of time. Got it. Uh, Claire Nelson? Hi, my name is Claire Nelson. I'm from Roosevelt, and surprisingly, I'm not here to talk about historic preservation. I'm actually here to talk about the environment. So right now, the current climate action plan, or the one that's on the city website, was written in 2009. That was 10 years ago, so I would really like to see the city revisit the climate action plan and place funds in the budget to implement those solutions. Furthermore, um, right now, our goal is a 40% reduction in emissions by 2025, which I think is good. You know, it's a reasonable goal, but that's not even halfway to the goal set up of 100% clean energy by the Paris Climate Accord in 2050. So I think the city needs to do better to become more a more sustainable and green city, and that includes expanding our, our infrastructure, expanding our public transportation, including light rail, um, making sure that our public transportation is as accessible and as environmentally friendly as possible. Um, also, I think we should update building codes to make sure that buildings are more sustainable and efficient. And I think we should also expand our recycling infrastructure, um, including like, you know, you got like trash cans at parks and stuff, like put recycling bins next to them. It's pretty simple. Um, you know, that's all I got to say. But I think we can do better. Is this St. Francis Strip? Santa Clara Strip. Okay, I'm looking for. Okay. Yeah, the only reason is because I wore that skirt. <laughs> That's why I was like, St. Francis, wait, she looks too. St. Yeah, well, I had that one. Um, Abraham J. So thank you for regarding the recycling. Uh, since I'm a recycling advocate, uh, people. Uh, always, uh, I embarrass people because I usually am picking through the garbage looking for cans and water bottles. Uh, I embarrass my kids sometimes because uh, they are responsible for sorting uh, cans and water bottles because uh, I said if you want that uh, Xbox or you want that game, then you can earn it and this is one lazy way to earn some money. I mean, and that sustainability is definite for me. Abraham. My name is Abraham James. I live at 2018 North 23rd Street uh, within the Red and Green Gables neighborhood. Um, full disclosure, I used to be the chair of the Citizen Transit Commission, so you probably know where I stand on that. Um, I also was the chair of the Encanto Village very much uh, uh, in support of the sustainability within our community. Um, currently, I am the chair of the uh, Ritter Green Gables Neighborhood Association, and um, I'm also the chair of the library at, at advisory board. As our city continues to grow and evolve, I would hope that with the additional funds within the city budget, that we that it would go toward aiding um, the homeless, substance addiction programs, and providing additional affordable housing within our downtown and uh, central Phoenix. Also, I would love if uh, additional funding would go toward increasing library hours, uh, which is very close to my heart. Uh, these are issues that have been with us for a while, and I would hope that with more funding, that uh, uh, funds should be available to continue these uh, various items. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank the City of Phoenix for all of its uh, positive support it has done for our citizens. Uh, through good and bad times, uh, the mayor, vice mayor, um, uh, council members, city manager's office, department 
leaders and staff have been helpful in addressing the issues as our city continues to evolve. Thank you for your support for the Office of Arts and Culture, the Library, Historic Preservation, uh, Neighborhood Parks, the Youth and uh, Senior Students. Um, and also, I really appreciate your support for streets and transportation, the police, and fire protection. I applaud you for what you do for the city of Phoenix. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your public service. A.J. Marston.
and trying to uh, connect them to services. And it's a team, it's a, uh, I would say, a behavioral health team that uh, makes contact with the homeless or the transient population. In addition to that, they make contact, they try to connect them to services, and usually it's a repeat of seven times. Um, Phoenix Cares uh, came about last year, and funding was part of it uh, in order for to help with the homeless and the transient population, um, and, and really looking at the needs that were happening within the community. It's a multidisciplinary uh, of departments. Uh, many departments are, are from the city of Phoenix are part of this, starting with. NSD, uh, Human Services, uh, Parks, Library, Police, Prosecutors, Public Works, Streets, and Fire. So all these departments are working collectively uh, with Phoenix Cares. There's one main number, and then that one main number you call, and then behind the scenes it's getting um, uh, your problem or situation is then getting routed to the right department so that it's a seamless service uh, when you call. Uh, you were to receive a phone call, uh, you open up a case, you were to receive a phone call from Phoenix Care saying where it's at within the case and when it's closed. Uh, so it is a process within the city of Phoenix. Um, that's Harry. I saw him leave, so he, and he did not want to speak. That's the last card. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for being here. I'd like to thank staff that's here. I uh, really appreciate that your involvement in the budget hearing. Uh, we have, I have five budget hearings, so uh, my next one, let me tell you where, uh, sometime this week, and then next week I have two more. So you're more than welcome to join me. Okay, my next one is Tuesday at 6 p.m. at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Uh, would love to see you. Um, and I think everybody should drive home safe and get with their family and eat some dinner. Good evening. <laughs>